Hello everyone, my name is Pixlriffs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. In today's episode, we're going to step outside of the Dripstone Cave and into the surrounding biome. We have a jungle biome right here, there's a savanna over there, but we're going to be focusing on the jungle for the time being, because today I think it's time to recruit some more villagers. I've had some success trading with the village that's actually over there in the savanna, about a thousand blocks in that direction, but I decided I wasn't going to interfere too much with the natural thing of villagers, you know, the, the natural population and recruiting just the types of villagers I want. We wanted to take a more holistic look at village management in the episodes where we messed with that village, and I kind of want to step outside of that today and focus a lot more on a player-centric model of villager trading, the kind of thing that's going to hook us up with the resources that we want in larger supplies. We're going to be setting up a villager trading hall in the near future, and to start with, I wanted to show off some of the secret villagers. Two of the biomes in Minecraft have biome-specific villager outfits with no actual structures to form a village out here. A jungle is one of them, and the swamp is the other one. And I think there are a couple of reasons why they didn't want to include jungle and swamp villages in Minecraft when they revamped villages back in the Village and Pillage update, and these two biomes had these outfits added. I think number one is that the environment of a jungle is a little bit difficult for villagers to pathfind around. There's so much bamboo and leaves and stuff on the forest floor getting in the way that I imagine combining that with villager pathfinding would be a little bit of a nightmare. The same is true of swamps, really, because mob AI tends to work slightly differently and mobs slow down a lot when they're in water and there is a lot of water around swamp biomes. But out here, now that Minecraft has updated to 1.18 and there are larger biomes in a lot of places, there is a lot more common sparse jungle. This biome here, which is technically still part of the jungle biome, we can look at the biome data on our F3 debug information and as you can see that is a sparse jungle right there. Technically part of a jungle biome, but with a lot less foliage. And so if we wanted to, these would be an ideal place to set up a jungle village trading area. If we want to do customize a jungle village, I feel like that'd be a cool place to start. However, I'm thinking more about the utility of these villages and what I want to grab from them. Specifically, I want to have a lot more clerics which I can use to trade redstone from, and that way I don't have to go mining for redstone all of the time. There are plenty of other ways to get redstone, including raid farms and witch farms. We'll cover those in future episodes. But in the meantime, I think a nice active way of getting hold of a lot of redstone is to trade it from villages. And on rare occasions, when villages in neighboring biomes generate overlapping with biomes like jungles and sparse jungles and the village houses will blend into the next biome, you can occasionally find jungle villagers wandering around in combination with some of the other villagers. So if a savannah village generated on the edge of this sparse jungle biome, we would probably see a few jungle villagers walking around. The same goes for swamp villagers. If an adjacent village ends up overlapping the boundary of a swamp, you might find a few swamp villagers there as well. But for the most part, you won't typically find villagers generating that close. It's basically a bit of a coincidence if it does happen. And so the only way of acquiring swamp and jungle villagers is to wait until nightfall and wait for a zombie villager to spawn in one of those two biomes. So that's what we're going to do today, and to help that along a little bit, we are going to clear out some of the blocks from around here. We're going to clear out a bit of the bamboo so there's a bit more spawning space, but we'll probably rely on the openness of this sparse jungle over here to provide enough space for hostile mob spawns and probably a large enough biome that we can stand in a certain location and make sure that hostile mobs only spawn within this area. Once we spot a zombie villager, we're going to trap it, we're going to cure it, and we'll get to look at the hidden jungle villager outfits that you normally never get to see in Minecraft. Minecraft. And that didn't take very long at all. I did fly up into the air and fly back down just to make sure that none of the mobs were spawning in caves around here and a bunch of mobs have now spawned on the surface including over here one zombified villager. Now if I can get him away from the other mobs around here, which is of course easier said than done, we should be able to trap him in some kind of box. And it looks like we have another one coming to join him actually, so maybe we can get away with doing two of these at a time. I do have a bunch of splash potions of weakness and golden apples all prepared just in case we are able to catch a couple here, but I think we're going to be able to do that here like so. Yes, there we go. Okay, we got one. We'll put a torch in there with you and block that off, and now we should hopefully be able to trap the last one in here. Of course, we could be doing this with boats or something like that if we wanted to make it easier for ourselves, but there we go. Nice and straightforward. A couple of zombie villager catches just as the sun is about to come up. 
Now, since they are so close together, we should actually be able to splash both of these with one potion of weakness, and as long as we've got two golden apples to feed them, we can probably take care of this in one go. So there we go, splash potion of weaknesses in, golden apple for you, golden apple for you, and hopefully those two should cure. Now, I'm going to sit here and babysit them because we haven't name-tagged either of them, so we do want to make sure that they will not despawn, but I'm hoping that in a short time we should have a couple of cured jungle villages. Okay, that is one cured, and over here, this one should cure soon. I just need to make sure that they stay separate for a second, just so the zombie villager doesn't go after the other villager now that he's been cured. And while we only get a glimpse of that new villager outfit whilst they are a zombie, because the zombified villagers all have a profession, we should be able to see once this fella is done curing what the regular jungle villager looks like when it doesn't have any kind of assigned job. And there he is! What a handsome man. Look at that. Look at that popped collar. All right, so we now have two fully cured jungle villagers. And just so they don't go any further, I am going to put them in boats now after all. We'll also need the boats to row them over to the location where I plan to have them because we are probably not going to leave them out in the open here for very long. This will also allow us to get a slightly better look at their outfits. So if we throw a boat down here and hopefully this guy should wander on into it. And while he's standing up in the boat like this, you can kind of see that the jungle villager outfit resembles maybe like an ocelot pelt or something like that. It's got a green leafy waistband and a couple of cocoa bean pods dangling off the side of here. Honestly, to me, they've always looked like cheeseburgers, and so that's typically what I think of these as, as cheeseburger villagers. But once our second friend decides to leave his little house, there we go, we have two jungle villagers safely in boats, and we're going to row them over to a little closer to our dripstone cave, actually, because I think we're going to set up a villager trading hall just over there. So just to make sure that we avoid any mishaps with these so that they don't end up despawning as zombified villagers, we're going to make sure that we sleep regularly and that we get them over to a safe place as quickly as possible. So our two jungle villagers are now parked in their little boat garage here, and we're actually going to introduce them to each other again in just a second, because we of course want to breed villagers over here, instead of curing all of these zombified villagers every single time, which is going to allow these two to breed up a new population of jungle villagers for us. And as long as they remain within the jungle biome, they should produce jungle-themed offspring. Now, if you move villagers to different biomes, for example, if we were to move these jungle villagers out to a snowy plains biome, there's about a 50-50 chance that they would produce offspring that had the jungle outfit, and the other half of the time they would produce villagers which have the snowy biome outfit, the one with, like, you know, a uh, pom-pom hat and everything like so they've they've clearly got a little bit of an eye for the surroundings and that is potentially another way you could get hold of jungle villagers without curing them from the zombified villagers if you end up bringing a bunch of villagers over to this biome and breeding them but you're not going to get jungle villagers 100% of the time and that's really what I wanted for this area because I want this area to feel kind of like a jungle trading post for our mining outpost over here and they're going to be trading us a bunch of the stuff that we need to carry on our mining operation we're not going to move them into the mine itself though because there are still some dark spots out there which need spawn proofing and the idea behind a villager trading hall in the first place is that it keeps the villagers relatively safe. Not only does it make it easier for you to trade with the villagers but it also protects the villagers enough that they're not going to get attacked by any marauding zombies. The first thing we're going to do though is set up a nice simple villager breeder setup where these two will basically be able to produce baby villagers as often as they want to, as often as they're able to really. So we're going to head up here, we're going to set up a nice little area probably just dug into the cliff face here making sure it is well lit and well protected and we're going to set up an area where these two can farm carrots to their heart's content. So over here the new home for our villagers is coming together. I have a composter in the center of the room with a sneaky water source underneath it so the villagers won't end up bobbing up and down in the water source and around that we have four blocks of space in every direction which is the furthest that the farmland here will hydrate because we're going to turn this into a giant field of crops that the villagers will enjoy. Either carrots or potatoes should do the trick. I recommend against using beetroot or wheat seeds to plant these. Beetroot might not be so bad, but villagers have limited inventory space behind the scenes, and you don't want too much of that inventory space to get filled up with beetroot seeds and have no room to receive beetroot from the other villagers. So carrots and potatoes are ideal because the crop you plant is also the crop that you eat, and in this case the crop that the villagers will breed with. Now what we're going to do on this side of the room is have a series of slabs or trapdoors at 
one block up from the ground there. So there's a full block of space under which baby villagers could run. And the idea is that we're going to line a pit here with trap doors that's going to have water streams in it. And the beds are going to be on the opposite side of the room here. So the adult villagers will not be able to walk out of the farm and pathfind towards some of these beds, but the baby villagers will. And every time it reaches nighttime, they're going to try and pathfind towards those beds, either so they can jump up and down on them or so that they can sleep in them. And instead, they're going to find themselves falling into water, which will redirect them elsewhere. And that's really one of the most important functions of this whole thing is to get the baby villagers away from those beds so that these villagers in here are going to see the beds are empty and want to continue breeding. In the meantime, we're probably going to have our baby villagers pipe down here into another area of the jungle, probably on the opposite side of the river, maybe slightly closer to our ink farm if we feel like setting up over there. And that's where we're going to set up our trading post. That's going to have an area that we can zombify and cure the villagers to improve their prices for us, but it's also going to have a place where the villagers can stay secure, not run around too much and not ultimately get attacked by zombies or anything like that. Basically, if we want these villagers to be zombified at all, we want that to happen under our control, basically under our watchful eye to make sure that they don't end up taking damage and dying. But with our field here all complete, I need to go and grab some crops that we can plant there, and I'll probably get those from the savannah village over here. Since we do still have a carrot and potato field all set up over here, I think I might just grab the carrots from this one and replant them. Now with this field all set up for them, we're going to row our farmers in towards the composters and and hopefully we should be able to get them close enough that they'll assign themselves to the composters and become farmers. We're going to do this one at a time, of course, to make sure that we can get them back into the boats after we've removed them, but this should be pretty straightforward to do. It looks like this guy might have found his composter already, so we do need to make sure that he's going to stay in there. He's at least found that there's a bed over here, and it looks like, yep, he found that simple enough, and now he's become a farmer. Perfect. We can do a bit of boat juggling with this guy, make sure that he steps out of here and into the next boat. Nope, he's already off. <laughs> okay, that didn't last long, did it? But it looks like he may be pathfinding in the right direction to locate our second composter over there in the wall. So we're just going to make sure there is a spot for him to walk on through. And perfect, a villager pathfinding is much more reliable than it used to be. That was plain sailing. Now, in theory, zombies shouldn't be able to get in here either. Of course, we have to be concerned with baby zombies, so we are going to temporarily block off areas like this. If we're going to be leaving these villagers alone for any stretch of time, we do need to make sure that they're going to have enough room in there. And one thing I've noticed is happening, which we should probably avoid, is that this villager is trampling the crops because his workstation over here is something that he can walk up onto. So I think we're going to put a jungle slab up there as well. We could also just put a stone block there but that should guarantee that he's not able to jump up and down next to the composter and that should prevent him from trampling the crops over here in this area. I boxed them in like this temporarily because we need to go back to spawn to our wool farm and make sure we have enough wool to make a bunch of beds over here. We also need to dig a tunnel under here into which all of the baby villagers will be going and pipe them over to the other side of the river. So we'll probably spend a bit of time doing that and in the meantime we'll make sure that these villagers stay nice and safe in here. Now, once the carrot field in here has grown, these two farmers are going to start harvesting crops and they'll hold on to those crops for a little while. But you may remember from our episodes about villager breeding that villagers will distribute excess crops to each other in order to make sure that the village has enough food. And once villagers have enough food, then they should start producing babies as long as there are adequate beds available for them. And so over here, we've set up seven beds. We don't need seven, but seven is just a convenient number for this setup. As long as there are at least three beds here, one for each of these villagers and one for a child, you should find that they're interested in producing a third villager. That third villager is going to run over here in an attempt to pathfind towards the beds. They're going to run under the slabs, over the trap doors, and down into this water channel, which is going to direct them down into a tunnel that I've started laying out over here. And at that point, we're not going to have them go anywhere quite yet. I'm actually going to seal off the roof of this tunnel. We're going to throw some torches in here just for visibility, but we shouldn't need to worry too much about mobs spawning in the water down here. And we're going to seal off this tunnel for the moment so that we can figure out exactly where some of these villagers are going to go. They'll end up right here for now at the end of this water stream and then they'll just stop here for a while. And depending on how far away they are from the villagers in here, they may not end up considering those beds part of their points of interest anymore and that will mean that they unpair from those beds and they look for something else. When that happens, the villagers who are up here will continue making offspring until eventually we'll end up with a whole bunch of villagers 
hanging out in here. And if we end up with more than 24 of them, they might start to entity cram because you can't have more than 24 mobs in a single space in default vanilla Minecraft without them starting to cram together and ending up taking suffocation damage. So what we're going to do just in order to prevent that from happening is grab a couple of the vines from the jungle around here and place them on these last two blocks. Typically when that happens the mobs will try to climb the vines and when mobs are climbing vines entity cramming doesn't usually take place. So with a few of these vines gathered from over the entrance here we should be able to prevent our villagers from dying that way. Alternatively we may not need Need more than 24 villagers so chances are we won't need to worry too much about this after all but I think it's a neat way of demonstrating that entity cramming can be bypassed as long as you keep an eye on these things because of course too many entities like villagers can potentially start to lag out your world. We also want to make sure there aren't any open corners directly diagonal from the area that all of these villagers are going to be standing because those can still potentially be points at which zombies can pathfind towards the villagers and damage them through the corner of a block. In in the meantime we're going to make sure that this area is boxed off because if I step away from this for too long there's a chance that a zombie could end up walking over here and falling into the water streams and that will eventually lead to all of the villagers down the end of there being zombified and despawning. So popping a fence gate in here, making sure this area inside is adequately lit, and then boxing off the entire thing, we're going to leave our villagers to breed for a little while and hopefully when we come back we should have a whole bunch of baby villagers waiting for us. A short time later, our villagers in here have been doing pretty well. I have actually been spending a bit more time in this area, sort of closed in and AFK, so that the villagers have time to breed. Because I don't know if the breeding actually requires a player to be super close by, but the crops growing does. I needed to be within 128 blocks of the farm so that the carrots could even grow, which meant that even though I was doing some work in the dripstone cave, the villagers hadn't really been doing all that much to produce any younger villagers. That has now changed, because down here in this little tank, and somebody from my stream audience actually correctly pointed out that it was probably not a good idea to have vines here in case the baby villagers climbed up onto the vines and then grew up and suffocated in the block above. So I ended up putting a glass block up here and adding a couple of blocks around the outside. But as you can see, we have a great deal of villagers now. And you'll also notice that some of them are not wearing the jungle outfit. In fact, I did not realize there are a couple of children in there. So those have already escaped and I'll probably need to grab some boats to contain them. That's one for you. And let's see if we can snag this guy before he gets in the bed. Yes, there we go. One for you. Unfortunate that we had to <laughs> let them out of there. But as you can see, this guy right here is dressed as a villager of the type you typically find in planes. Whereas the other one down here, we'll call him his brother, I guess is a cheeseburger, is a jungle villager. And that kind of goes to prove my point earlier about the different biomes having an effect, because despite the fact that these two are jungle villagers, the biome that they're in underneath here is kind of not a jungle. It's jungle up until about there, and then on the top surface here it is a pretty standard Minecraft forest, birch trees and oak trees and everything, and I believe down there where the villagers are, it actually registers as Dripstone Cave because of the Dripstone Cave that forms on the edge of this mountain here. So our villagers who come out of this villager breeder setup are going to be a bit of a mix of the two, and that's kind of fine. I kind of like the idea of not having just one set of villager outfits. Obviously they're going to be overlaid with the different professions and stuff as well, but I like the fact that we're going to have a bit more variety over here. I say over here, but I actually mean over there. I've been clearing out a bit of area here in the jungle because I kind of wanted to set up a trading outpost over here relatively close to the dripstone cave. Somewhere that I can just pop out and go and see the villagers as quickly as possible, and somewhere that I can take in fantastic views like this one. This right here is the cave at the back of the dripstone cave up there. That like, little section up there I think leads to the platform where I've got a bit of storage, and I really like having stuff like this out here. So rather than have this little hollow lagoon area hidden away, I decided why not build an area next to it. And inspired by the dripstone around here, and a bit of stuff I've done in the past and the fact that the villagers outfits are more kind of like animal pelt style things I figured we could probably make this feel like a bit more of a prehistoric area like the kind of thing where there's a primitive civilization that's lived here for a while and they trade whatever they've got to hand and so going with a kind of cartoonish take on that a bit more flintstones kind of vibe I'm thinking maybe we can get some bone blocks in here we can use some of the dripstone to act as like teeth for animal skulls like dinosaur skulls or something like that around here maybe blow it up to a little bit larger than life size and we could do some really neat looking trading posts around here to make it a bit more than the average villager trading hall which is just a bunch of villagers 
side by side in booths separated out so that you can trade with them nice and easily. I don't want this to be a free roam village but I also don't want it to look completely sterile. Also before they disappear because inevitably they will at some point shout out to this floating piece of vine that got left by one of the trees generating kind of weirdly in here. Typically a block update will get rid of stuff like this because it shouldn't really exist without being attached to a block. So if I place a block adjacent to these vines they are going to break but for now I'm just going to leave them there because I kind of I, I, I don't know. I like the glitchiness of Minecraft sometimes. I really like stuff like that. So we've got the vibe going on down here. At least we've got a couple of bone blocks around here. I decided diorite was going to work pretty well with this. Sort of went with a vaguely Stonehenge inspired formation, I guess. But the whole thing looks a little bit more primitive. Fits with the jungle villagers Flintstones vibe. And all we need to do now is connect them up with rails and snag a couple of villagers from out of this little containment pod. In fact, we might even start with our two friends over here who have been trapped in boats because I feel like they need to be let loose very briefly and then put in minecarts so they can stay up there for the foreseeable future. But first I have to remember where I've left all of my iron. I think some of it might be down here in the area with the copper aging machine and while I'm on the way down here I can explain something. Because some folks were a little bit confused about why exactly the machine stopped there instead of level with the floor of the copper aging setup. And the reason is because the floor of the copper aging setup isn't actually what I want to be the floor. I'm planning for there to be a raised walkway throughout the entire thing so the fact floor part of it isn't necessarily something that the player needs to interact with at all. Instead, we have a kind of section of the mine shaft that comes out down here and leads into the main walkway, the kind of catwalk, I suppose, for the machine itself. So the idea is that the player gets to walk up and down on a platform around the height of these honeycomb blocks here, and we don't need to worry too much about what's down further below. Now, let's see if we have any iron in here. I have a little bit of raw iron. I have a lot of raw iron, actually, but I don't know if there's any regular iron or minecarts around here. Luckily for me, I have a bunch of lava-powered blast furnaces, so this shouldn't take very long at all. <laughs> and first thing the following morning, we're going to carve out a bit of the landscape here to make way for the minecart rail that's going to pick up the villagers from this little containment area here. <laughs> This is very disturbing looking. A handful of rails later, we're going to drop off our first villager in here, and we're going to make sure that this whole area is decorated so that the villager is accessible to us, the player, but shouldn't be at threat from any zombies or anything that happens to wander into the area. And we're going to kick off the proceedings with Cheeseburger Villager number one. Let's get him rode into place, and let's see if we can, hopefully, trap him inside some rails to make sure that he doesn't pathfind away. Now, this works with most mobs, but I wonder if his pathfinding is going to be too strong and he's going to try and find himself a bed over there. Let's find out. Yep, looks like he doesn't want to walk over the rails. Perfect. So now all we should need to do is slide a minecart around him, maybe nudge him into a corner over here for good luck. There we go. Now he's in the minecart and now we should just be able to push him on down the track or he's going to do that himself and he should roll right into place. Beautiful. Now for now we're going to keep them in the minecarts because that will keep them stationary and we're probably going to set up something a little devious a bit later on because of course the best way to get good prices out of these villagers is going to be to zombify and cure them a couple of times. But we don't need to do that quite yet, primarily because all I want to do at first is trade with clerics for redstone, and the redstone prices are always fixed. They don't trade you more redstone per emerald. The only reason where it really helps to zombify and cure the villagers is if you want to sell them something, and you want to sell a minimum amount of that resource to obtain the maximum amount of emeralds for the amount of stuff you put in. So I'm not going to worry about that too much right now, and yep, that guy has unfortunately gone the way of the pathfinding. Oh well, well, I've got a boat right here for him. And here's a fact you may or may not have known, it's actually possible to get a boat in a mine cart if you do it right. Although you do sometimes need to worry a little bit about the physics involved there and the villager is still in the boat so if we break the minecart the villager should still be in a boat and who knows what's going to happen from there. So I think we're probably going to be better off making sure he's surrounded by blocks before we go any further. The most straightforward way of avoiding the villager moving around too much, like hopping out to the side as he dismounts the boat and the minecart here, is just to make sure that all of the surrounding blocks have a block at head height. We can't place a block at foot height right now because of the boat being there, but that's not going to be a problem in just a second. Yes, there we go. We've now got rid of the boat. And if we stick another minecart here and break this block, hopefully we should be able to jimmy this villager around a little bit so that he'll get into the minecart. There we go, he's in. We've just got to replace a couple of rails and we'll be able to slide him on into position. Perfect. This is the point at which I've actually decided to break the vines inside of here because I don't think entity cramming is really going to be an issue and we're also going to be left with a bunch of villagers who are nestled up against this corner of the block here. And that's actually going to allow us to roll a minecart down into that corner. The minecart's hitbox will interact with the villager's hitbox and we get one villager pulled out of the box without having to open it up and expose it to zombies. 
So our next jungle villager gets moved into the trading setup and we're just going to keep going around until we have a full complement of villagers here. So now we've got a few of these villagers in their trading stations, how exactly are we going to prevent zombies from attacking them? Well, fortunately for us, that's going to be relatively simple, and it's just going to require us to place a few blocks around the outside of the spot where the villager is, and the zombies won't be able to get close enough to deal any damage. We're going to place the villager's workstation in front of them, which hopefully they should understand that they can pathfind to, and if not, we are just going to have to remove them from the minecart. That should be no problem, though, because... We're going to have plenty of blocks around them to make sure that they cannot get out of this area. In fact, as long as we make sure that the block above is not a full block, we should now be able to remove this villager from his minecart. We'll just make sure that this block around the back is all boxed off and do the same right there. And with careful precision... Oh, no, he's on top of the wall now. Oh, dear. And, well, he's climbing the trees, so <laughs> it looks like he's definitely acc accustomed to the jungle environment. There we go. Let's get him back in the boat. I honestly didn't expect him to be able to get up onto the wall. That's actually kind of impressive. Anyway, we'll put some fences there to make sure that that doesn't happen a second time. All right, now he's back in there. Let's go for take two. We're going to put the trap door on top of the brewing stand there. We're going to put these two fences on either side. There we go. And now... There we go, he's in. And the trap door is actually quite important in this setup because that's what should give the villager the idea that he can pathfind around this workstation. Now you'll notice that the villagers don't always pair to their workstations straight away. And often that's a time of day thing. You just need to wait for the next working day and then the villagers will typically be looking for points of interest. They'll look for beds and they'll look for workstations. And so in the meantime, we can use our time to make sure the remaining villagers are out of their minecarts. And there we go, what time is it? It's kind of just after midday, I guess, but these two have just paired to their workstations, which means that they should now, there it is, have redstone dust trades for us. Perfect. This guy here is next to come out of the minecarts, and this right here is going to be a tricky one, because this villager has managed to claim this workstation even though he's still in the minecart. Unfortunately, the baby villager here is not going to be able to use the same workstation, so we can do a little bit of trickery here if we want to, and if we roll this baby villager out of the way temporarily, we could have the villager standing on top of the workstation. So we can have one brewing stand here and one brewing stand in front of them like so and the baby villager on top of this brewing stand should use that as their workstation when they need to refill their trades. The only problem right now is that this guy is trying to pair to the workstation when I put it down there because it's an available workstation so we might need to wait for this guy to grow up. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Perfect timing. So let's roll him back over there. He's not quite going to come off of there quite yet. I think he's colliding with this guy's minecart. That's the problem. We can just about get him around there. And let's see if we place that down there. Yep, he's going to pair to the workstation. Fantastic. Now let's roll our friend here back a space just so the other guy can fit in. We'll put one more piece of rail right there and we'll roll him onto the brewing stand. Now he's in there for good. We can put another brewing stand down right here and hopefully the other guy should pair to that. Yes. There we go, he looks like he's paired just fine. So despite the fact that there is one brewing stand here, this guy now looks a little bit shorter than the other one, which is kind of cool actually, and this guy should now refill his trades using the brewing stand that he is standing on. There are a few different ways that this kind of setup can go, but unfortunately villagers cannot pair to workstations which are at head height for them. The block needs to be interacting with the half of the villager around the feet, which is kind of a weird rule, but once you understand it, it's fairly straightforward. It should also now be possible, now that we've blocked off the areas around around here to remove this guy from his minecart. Ah, <laughs> yeah, they can move diagonally. That's a concern. But maybe if we put a trap door over the top of this one and break the minecart there. Oh, they've swapped places. Okay, now let's see if they end up pairing to the opposite workstation. But the trap doors in front of these villagers are actually important for more reasons than just villager pathfinding. They will also make sure that the gap in front of each villager is less than a block tall, which means if baby zombies come running up around here, they won't be able to attack the villagers through this one block gap because it's less than one block and the baby zombie won't be able to get up there. I do have concerns about the gap between the hitbox of this brewing stand and the hitbox of the neighboring wall, though. So, oh, I really shouldn't have put a campfire here. Let's move that for a second. Yeah, I think that might be a little bit too much space, and I think a baby zombie might be able to sneak in there. So maybe we should swap these walls out for full blocks, just in case baby zombies decide to come up around here during the nighttime. There we go. I've swapped them all out for jungle logs for now. But the main reason I like having walls there is so that it's easier for XP to travel between the workstation and the neighboring 
brewing wall, so that once you're done trading with the villager, you can collect the XP. With brewing stands, it's less of an issue, but this is why a lot of trading halls like to have the villagers standing on top of their workstations, so that there is a gap here through which the XP can flow. Of course, that leaves the villager potentially open to attack from zombies or whatnot, but a lot of villager trading halls tend to be indoors for that reason. I kind of like the open air feel we've got going on with this though, so maybe we'll move some of the bone blocks and stuff around so they're more visible behind the trading stalls here, but I like the vibe. I think it's working pretty well. While eventually we will have a couple of zombified and cured traders over there that we can get emeralds from, in the meantime I'm returning to this village where I should be able to trade a bunch of the diorite that I've been mining down in my beacon strip mine for a few emeralds. Not to mention the Fletchers have a pretty awesome string trade and there's all sorts of other trades here that I can take advantage of. And then back at our jungle trading post, even as the sun goes down, we can trade ourselves a bunch of redstone dust from these clerics. And <laughs> it's going to be very cool to see how much redstone we can acquire this way. We've already got 48 just from two trades. The real test is going to be making sure each of these villagers has access to their workstation and can refresh those trades, <laughs> especially now that they've started to open up a couple of other trades. This one here looks like he's unpaired from that workstation that he was seeing before, so my concern is that this brewing stand here is potentially the one that this cleric is looking at. So in order to fix that, we should be able to remove this brewing stand, and hopefully this guy will pair to the brewing stand at his feet, and then we'll put another one back in here, and that's going to convert this guy into a cleric who should be able to trade us redstone, and that'll lock in his profession so that he can't ultimately lose it. So hopefully these two will now have figured out whose workstation is who. And if we have any more issues with that, then there's a couple of other things we can do, probably just moving this guy away and redesigning the trading hall so they're not on a diagonal with each other. But there we go, we heard the uh, telltale sound of the brewing stands bubbling, which means each of these clerics should now have refreshed their trades. So let's see if we can trade with each one of them in turn. All looking good so far, and our friend over here has refreshed his trades as well. So it seems like they're now recognizing the right workstations. That is very, very good news. And from these five clerics, we now have almost four full stacks of redstone and that's 26 more redstone blocks under the belt perfect stuff i think they might even have just refreshed again meaning that i can exhaust my current supply of emeralds and go and find somebody who can trade us some more i am considering moving a couple of these villagers in as stonemasons so that we could sell them the excess decorative stone types that we had from the digging site in there from the uh, beacon strip mine but for now i think that's probably where we're going to leave it for this episode folks i hope you've enjoyed taking a look at the secret jungle villagers in minecraft with me and we'll probably take a look at swamp villagers some other time as well but in the meantime we have the makings of a trading hall here and i'm excited to continue exploring that as a concept later this week so thank you so much for watching this episode of the minecraft survival guide my name has been pixel Rifts. don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it subscribe to my channel if you want to see more and i'll see you folks soon take care bye for now <laughs>